Thanks, guys, for coming. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, I'm Evie J, and uh, I'm going to talk to you. Yeah, so like it, like Amanda said, the basically the background for my project. You know, I'm a new M Phil, so it's this is kind of the story that leads up to my project, um, and then an explanation of what I'm actually going to do and what I hope what I hope to learn. Um, so yeah, so I study the biological significance of archaic introgression on modern humans. And I promise that will mean something to you in a little. Um, but basically, I'm going to be talking to you about the who, what, where, when, and why of archaic hominid interbreeding, by which I mean sex between modern humans and archaic hominid species. So that's what I study, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, and then when we get to the why, that really gets into what, what my project actually is. But you got to get the, through the other questions before that will that will be it. Uh, great. So first question, who? So when I talk about um, these archaic hominins, there are two species, at least there are species, but really there's not enough uh, fossils to really get a sense of the variability. So really, uh, population or group uh, is probably a more accurate, uh, fle flexible taxonomic definition. But so. One, one main group we're talking about here are the Neanderthals, and Neanderthal is really the way you should say it. We can talk to the Germans about it after. Um, but uh, broadly, broadly speaking, um, <laughs> call down. <laughs> uh, broadly speaking, Neanderthals lived in between 250,000 to 40,000 years ago. Um, everything in this field is super hotly debated, so some people will put 350,000 as the, the old extreme, and even uh, 28,000 is the youngest extreme, but I picked a pretty conservative uh, time range there. Um, so we, we already do know a lot, um, uh, comparably a lot about Neanderthals, um, because we have a lot of, a relative uh, lot of fossils and uh, associated archaeology with them. So here you have a comparison of a Neanderthal skeleton with a modern human. So shorter, you can't really tell there, but the bones are much thicker, they're very uh, stocky, um, slightly different shaped uh, rib cage, the skull was different, larger um, nasal capacity, as you can see there, um, and the colloquial definition of the word Neanderthal, you know, you think like dumb and brutish, but the more we learn about Neanderthals, the more it seems that um, there are a lot more like modern humans than, than um, you think. And uh, this is a find from uh, last summer that is uh, it's cave art in Spain that almost certainly was done by Neanderthals, not by modern humans. So they could have had art, they probably had art, and with art comes symbolic thought and maybe language and all these other things that um, previously were attributed only to um, anatomically modern and behaviorally modern humans. So Neanderthals, pretty cool. I mean, how can we tell that mm -hmm. it was? Great question. Stuff. Great question. So um, this site dates to 42,000 years ago in Spain. And modern humans, there's no evidence for them being in that region um, at that early date. Um, and also, the only, um, the only uh, physical evidence of hominid occupation in that cave is Neanderthal. So there's no reason to oh, expect. <laughs> There's no reason to think that it wouldn't be Neanderthals, aside from the fact that no one has ever given Neanderthals enough credit to think that uh, they, they would have done that. So that's Neanderthals. Now the other uh, hominid species that, we're species that we're talking about here are the Denisovans, um, which I'm guessing some of you have never heard of, but they're really cool, and I think you will hear about them more and more. Um, uh, so, uh, in 2008, a cave in Siberia was excavated uh, over there. The green here represents the known Neanderthal range. Um, and this cave in Siberia was being excavated. They found some Neanderthal remains that were very excited. They found this kind of weird looking molar and this little piece of a finger bone. And they wanted to uh, take DNA from the finger bone to see, um, as you can see, it's a very small little bone, but you can actually get a lot of DNA from that. Um, and they want sequence it, hoping to get a good, nice Neanderthal sequence. And they did it, and it looked weird, and they did it again, and it still looked weird. And after doing it a whole bunch of times, they decided, hey, this is something different. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, that finger bone and that molar represent the only known finds of an entirely different population, the Denisovans, which are a sister lineage to the Neanderthals. So this is the accepted phylogeny we have here. So 
Um, Neanderthals and Denis Denisovans have a common ancestor that had a common ancestor um, with modern humans. So we hardly know anything at all about the species. Like I said, these are literally the only physical remains that we know of, although I think given, um, given how similar they probably look to Neanderthals, given how similar we look like to Neanderthals, and they're even closely, more closely related to them than we are, there are Neanderthal finds somewhere that are categorized as Neanderthals that are Denisovan. Like, I, I'm certain of that. I make that statement. Um, so I think we'll hear more about these guys um, physically uh, at some point in the future. But what we do know is that they are closely related to Neanderthals and that they interbred with modern humans. So that's the who, the what, uh, <laughs> talking about uh, interbreeding between these species and this rise of the planet of the Earth, the original Planet of the Apes is a really ridiculous movie, and you can talk to me about that later. But, uh, okay, so we did the who, we did the what, so now the where and the when. So the main uh, information that you need to know for the where and the when to make sense is that all non-African humans should have 1 to 4% Neanderthal DNA. All non-African humans. Um, that percentage is slightly higher for East Asians, and we'll, I'll talk about that with my um, next slide, but I will tell you that I think it doesn't mean that much. Um, and so that's for on the Neanderthal side, and on the Denisovan side, the only human populations that have um, direct Denisovan DNA that we found are um, people indigenous to Melanesia, so uh, Papua New Guinea, Australia, um, that that area, and they have a higher percentage. They have about four to six percent uh, Denisovan admixture. So what does that mean for the yeah? Sorry. So actually, that's not. Yeah, it's about to make more sense if you, yeah. Okay, so in terms of where and when, what does that mean? So if all non-Africans have um, uh, Neanderthal DNA at a fairly constant rate, what that probably means is that the admixture with Neanderthals occurred just as humans were leaving Africa in the population that was an is ancestral to all non-Africans, so all the humans that left Africa. So that probably means, based on what um, is known about the root out of Africa, that the admixture, the where, is in the Middle East, in the, in the Levant. And that would have happened, like I said, to the common population that, that left Africa, and then dispersed across the world. Um, the dating, like I said, that everything is question marks. Um, so out of Africa is normally dated to around 50,000 years ago, but then maybe 80,000 years ago in the Middle East. Um, a recent paper uh, came out, that came out last week uh, pushed the dating of the Neanderthal admixture probably to like 60,000 years ago. Um, so that's probably the when-ish, and we're pretty comfortable with the where. Um, so uh, taking the East Asian slightly higher percentage, there could have been a secondary Neanderthal admixture um, in East Asia, maybe, but um, the percentage is not different enough that it couldn't be explained just by drift and, and random forces. So it's definitely not uh, certain that there was a secondary admixture there. And then the Denisovan admixture, both the where and the when are very confusing. The where, much more so. Denisova cave is here in Siberia. The people who have the Denisova DNA live here. And no one in between has any. Um, so that's a pretty big mystery. Um, so either the Denisova range was like enormous, and they were also living down here, and yet we still only found one little tiny finger bone and one molar, and the interbreeding maybe occurred here. Or it means something interesting happened on the migration of the people uh, who are ancestral to this population. And some people in my research groups actually think that there was a separate out of Africa and earlier out of Africa that the only um, living lineages from that now are these oceanic populations and that's where the interbreeding occurred maybe, I don't know, that's still definitely uh, being being settled. Um, and the when is, is based on genetic data probably in that 80 to 50 to 40,000 somewhere mystery time period, but it's all question marks. Okay, so we did the who, we did the what, we did the where, we did the when. Now we're at what I think is the most interesting part, the why, and this is really what I'm looking into. And by why, what I mean is what did, what was the benefit of this interbreeding? Why, why do this? And of course, like I don't mean that the modern humans were like, hmm, what can I gain from this sexy Neanderthal over there? But uh, 
from an ultimate perspective, why? Why did this happen, and, and what can we see in modern humans that reflects reflects this ancient these ancient events? So, here I have a, a map of you know half the world, and so Neanderthals were living here, and you know Denisovans are somewhere in this mysterious land, um, and they're living there from. 250,000 years ago to 40,000 years ago, that was a pretty cold time to be living in Europe. And modern humans were living in Africa, adapted to a much, much warmer climate, and then leaving Africa. Leaving Africa to go to, you know, some of the, com compared to now, like the coldest environments that humans um, ever lived in, basically, and are completely physiologically maladapted for that sort of environment. But meanwhile, we've got our very close cousins who have been living um, in that area and have had 150,000 years um, at minimum to physiologically adapt to this environment. So maybe these interbreeding incidents, you know, you have these poorly adapted modern humans coming in, they interbreed with Neanderthals, they gain some really, uh, really beneficial genes from the Neanderthals, and then those genes are subsequently positively selected for. Um, and, and that can mean that it was really a beneficial uh, genetic flow. So there is some evidence that this, this really happened, that some of these uh, alleles that we got from Neanderthals were positively selected for. So these are two really big papers that did kind of full genome uh, searches for Neanderthal um, integration or genes that came from Neanderthals. And the interesting thing is, so I said there's that one, uh, one to four percent uh, DNA, uh, Neanderthal DNA in all of non-Africans. It's not distributed evenly across the genome. It's not that on every chromosome you've got you know one to four percent Neanderthal DNA, and that's what these studies found. So if you look at uh, this graph here, so the dotted lines represent the X chromosome uh, amount of introgression, and the solid lines are the autosomes. So what you find is that there's a, a, a significantly less Neanderthal DNA on the X chromosome. And that probably, that the, the authors of the study, and pretty much everyone agrees with them, um, hypothesize that this is because introgression onto the X chromosome, genes coming from um, unrelated populations, is really bad. Um, and will probably lead to male sterility, because there's a lot of genes on the X chromosome that need uh, need to be a certain way, and when you get uh, from slightly different species, it can lead to fertility problems. And that's what you think about, you know, when, when you hear, like, uh, oh, species can't interbreed because they make uh, sterile offspring, that's why, because of these uh, X chromosome uh, problems, among other things, but that, that's definitely one reason. So that could show that those X chromosome uh, Neanderthal alleles were being uh, negatively selected for, they were being pushed out. But there were some genes that were being uh, positively selected for, that were being built up. And the main finding by both these studies was um, one allele that affects keratin uh, filaments, which uh, relate to lighter skin tones and lighter hair tones. And that makes a lot of sense. So skin pigmentation is something that um, has been uh, selected for in different times and different locations in uh, human history, but basically if you're living in an environment with less sunlight, like cold, ice age Europe, um, you want your skin to be lighter so you can be absorbing more nutrients, from, like vitamin D and things like that from the sun, um, and you don't need the darker skin protection that uh, the modern humans coming out of Africa would have had. So maybe, you know, they get to, to Europe, this is a, kind of a problem, they interbreed and um, they get these genes for lighter skin tone that are being selected for. So that's, that's one, one thing that it is a why. And another study that took kind of the opposite approach, uh, so this, was, this study was done by collaborators with my research group, and they were looking, they weren't looking for intragrest alleles. They were looking for how Tibetan populations had, had, have adapted to high altitude living. So things related to their um, hemoglobins and oxygen uh, metabolism. And what they found was that there's this one allele on this EPIS1 gene that um, seems to be causing a lot of that. And they looked to see what other populations had this allele, and they couldn't find it in any other modern human population. But they did find that it was extremely similar to the Denisovan allele at that, um, at that gene. And that um, something like over 80% of modern day Tibetans actually have the Denisovan allele um, for, this, for this gene. 
which first of all tells us something maybe about the Denisovans, maybe they were living in high altitudes, maybe they were adapted here, and is another example of a beneficial gene, uh, beneficial allele that we could have gotten from an archaic hominid species. So what I'm doing for my project is looking for these um, intergress positively selected for alleles, um, but I'm, and I'm looking specifically for ones like the Tibetan gene, those population specific ones, because a lot of things have been looked at or with you know, this macro population of Europe, the macro population of East Asia. Um, but there are a lot of interesting populations that are smaller and more specific and live in more extreme climates that I think will be likely to have more of these interesting genes. So this is a, a map of where the samples that I'm using um, are coming from. Um, so what's, what I think is really cool is that we have all these Siberian um, samples, which Siberia is a very extreme climate and always has been, and Denisova Cave is there. Seems like there could be a lot of cool stuff there. Um, also, we have from Southeast Asia, Oceania, again, interesting populations to, to look at here. Um, clearly, it looks like there is a big deficiency in East Asia and, and somewhat in Africa too, but that's just because those are publicly available um, samples anyway, so we will be using some of those too. But I feel like we have a pretty good uh, span of the world here, so I'll be able to look um, at a lot of different populations and, and look for a lot of genes. Um, so, um, t yes? You have two samples from South America? Um, so we're actually, I'm not going to really be using any of the, because so the problem is when you're doing something like this, you want to have um, a pretty good sense of, you want, you, you don't, you know, like you wouldn't look at me and use me as an American, you know what I mean? Because clearly it's like an, a, a mixed up genetic population and all the Americans and indigenous Americans as well, uh, have a lot of admixture, so it would really, it's going to complicate uh, the study. Also, each of these dots represents, um, like, a more, it could be more than one person. It's like the locality. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not going to be using any of the American samples, probably. We just have access to these. Okay. If, if I wanted to. Probably I won't. But I could. <laughs> I'm just showing off my power. Okay. <laughs> so, to get kind of into the nitty-gritty a little bit of, of how I'm actually going to be doing this. So, this is just kind of a very small um, sampling of each of these here represents um, one human individual, and then I've got the Denisovan sample here. And for each of these SNPs, these single nucleotide differences, I'm looking to see does this human share more in common with the Denisovan or with the other humans? And everywhere that the human shares more in common with the Denisovan th that, than the other humans, that gets a one. And that means that it could be intergress, right? Because it is not sharing with the human, it's sharing with this other species that we're supposed to be less related to. So once I identify all these candidate alleles, uh, SNPs, then those are going to be grouped into bigger windows. So here, you know, you've got all these ones in a row, so that whole thing could have been intergressed. We'll call that a window. And then I'll look to see if I can put any windows together. So here, this is a whole like 500 stretch that, that fits the, the pattern that we're looking for. And um, to go on a little tangent, uh, the length of these samples is actually really, really important because length of, of alleles actually directly, no, had a whole hyperlink thing going on. <laughs> um, so length of the alleles directly correlates to time because if you start with um, you know, one allele, so we've got one gene, right? And we've got the blue version of this gene. And then over time, recombination happens and little bits of the gene get, of the allele get switched with, uh, with other alleles. So over time, your blue allele gets shorter. So that means that there's a, a direct relationship that you can compare of length to time. Um, so for example, so this probability I have here, so there's, if you have a gene that is shared, an allele that's shared between modern human and this archaic uh, individual, there are two explanations. One could be introgression, right? Like interbreeding, that's what we're looking for. But the other could be that this allele is actually even older than that, that it comes from when there was a common ancestor between modern humans and Denisovans, and it just, because of random incomplete, mix, incomplete sorting of alleles, there's like these little fragments that uh, I still have and the Denisovan still has, but not all humans have. So if it's really short, that can mean it's that old, like 300, 400,000 years old. 
And all these 500 lengths, these, these are more likely to be that than they are to be uh, the more recent introgression. But if you got something like 37,000 base pairs, that could be significant. That, there's only a 0.04% chance that that would have come from, uh, from archaic and complete sorting. Um, so that's, what I'm, that's the hope, to find these long stretches, um, but not, not too long, because that wouldn't make sense either if they're you know, um, likely to have come you know, 100 years ago. That wouldn't really make sense. Um, but this sweet spot of length and similarity, that those are the ones I'm looking for. And uh, hopefully, you know, with enough individuals and enough populations and enough Excel and R, I will, I will find some of these. Um, and then once that's done, the even more distant future plan um, for not this year, there's no way, uh, would be to do functional testing on these alleles that you find. because. Once you say, hey, this may have come from a Neanderthal or a Denisovan and been positively selected for, okay, well, what does it do? Why was it selected for? Um, and I think a lot of studies will put out, like, it probably does this because it's sort of associated with this medical disease, blah, blah, blah. I think, like, it'd be great to do actual real functional testing on these things using model organisms, hopefully. Um, and that's it. Um, thanks, guys. And just want to give a little shout out to my uh, PI, Dr. Tumas Kivisild, and the postdoc that I'm working with, Dr. Luca um, Pagani, and uh, the Division of Biological Anthropology, our two collaborators at the University of Tartu and Berkeley, and Gates Cambridge for funding. So, thank you.